Thank you very much, Lynn. Thank you, Antonella, for the very kind and appreciated invitation. And I'm really, really glad to be here with you. And uh, if I can start, because we had a lot of problems to upload the presentation. Okay, so can you start from there? No. It's. Uh, uh, I have to, yeah, we have to put something behind the. Yeah. Sorry. So. Well, because four years ago in Milan here, I had to give a lecture of 15 minutes without slides because there was no internet connection between the speaker's ready room and here. So I hope not to have the same experience, otherwise Milan it would be a little bit of trouble for me. So uh, these are my disclosures. So first of all, the question, the program, I would say more who is the patient? Well, you know, these are the famous pressure volume loop. This is a normal state, and the pressure volume is the stroke wall and all the work done by the ventricle with the, the pressure rise and then ejection, then diastolic. And when, when you have heart failure, you see you have a reduced stroke wall, so you reduce uh, volume and also an increase in, in diastolic pressure. But we know with VA ECMO, this goes even worse. So there is now a famous statement that the VA ECMO is a circulatory support, but not a ventricular support. So we have to be careful because this can be really a problem in our patients. So we have a, a bunch of negative effects based by the retrograde flow towards the heart. And you know, this is a little bit a problem, if I can make, yeah, because this you can see the stasis can be huge if the ventricle is not doing anything. And you can see here, the aortic valve is completely closed, and you can see again the stasis in the aortic root. And this is a big problem because particularly in patients, I make you an example, cardiac arrest. I mean, you have such a heart. You can't imagine that you can have a, 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 a very effective uh, ejection. And you can see here, look, again, stasis, and the aortic valve remains completely closed. So what do you expect in such a situation? You can see stasis and no aortic valve. So I show you one case I had a, a few months ago of a patient who had the type A dissection, and then uh, there was a rupture of the right coronary, a huge ischemia, complex procedure. We had to do a lot of things, and then we you can see the type A dissection. So after surgery, because of the huge ischemia of the right ventricle, we were forced to go on ECMO. So what to do? But you know, aortic dissection, so no aortic balloon pump, and so forth. So sometimes, even if you want to do, of course you have difficult things, because you can go from the right superior pulmonary vein and so forth, but there are critical situations. But unfortunately, we have some problems of maintaining the, the, the ACT in the normal range. And we had the mechanical prosthesis, and the, the, due to the stasis at the end, there was really reduced uh, a mechanical prosthesis, and uh, the aortic root completely thrombosed, completely. And I was forced to open and remove all the thrombi from uh, the uh, aortic root. So just to tell you that this can be really dramatic. But what about the incidence? I mean, if you talk to many people dealing with ECMO, is, it, is this a common problem? Well, I think this is, and you can see from Troby and colleagues that you have, in terms of left ventricular dis distension, you can see here the myocardial recovery, so the black bar, according to the kind or extent of left ventricular distension. And you can see recovery chance very low if you have uh, the distended left ventricle. Instead, reduced dilatation of the left ventricle, high chance of myocardial recovery. This was a little bit on the contrary. So Camboni and Smith from Regensburg, they said, is it really a problem in our experience? Well, in their experience, not. They say only 2%. Well, that was a little bit, in my opinion, a very optimistic rate. Indeed, Truby and colleagues, they said, or they wrote, 7% of the patient in VA ECMO required immediate 
the compression. And 22%, so we can make 30% at the end, 22 was, had subclinical, so they had the need of uh, uh, venting. So again, 30, almost 30% 30 of the patient had the need of, so Camboni 2%, Truby 30%. And take into consideration, 60% of the patients were in postcardiotomy. So Patel and colleagues, again, they showed that if you unload the ventricle, and this with the impella, so the famous Ekpella, this is really uh, useful. And you can see here what was the percentage of patients which they believed that it was really important. And here we showed something more important. That in some patients, as I showed before, you have an aortic valve which is not opening. This was a very, very limited series because we look at this particular situation where you go on ECMO and you have no aortic valve opening. And you can see here all peripheral ECMO, but look also at the etiologies of the VA ECMO. And I will come back later. So in 11 years, we had only these 10 patients, but I will show you a little bit more. But again, look, out of hospital cardiac arrest and postcardiotomy. So again, I, uh, I just suggest you to keep in mind cardiac arrest and postcardiotomy. So we go to who? Who are the, aggressive, the, sorry, the patients who are eligible or who should need? Well, for sure, in my point of view, post-cardiotomy. Post-cardiotomy is most likely after cardiac arrest patient or patient with acute myocarditis with very, very low contractility. But again, post-cardiotomy, very low contractility because of biventricular myocarditis and after cardiac arrest. But you can have also situation you have extensive damage. So the less is the contractility, the more you will be forced to go on venting. But when? Well, that's another very interesting uh, situation. I will skip this because uh, just to say that if you differentiate therapeutic, so you go on venting when you think is needed, or prophylactically, so from the beginning, look at the difference in 30-day mortality. So again, this shows that if you are proactive and not reactive, so if you act prophylactically, your chance of survival is much, much higher. You see, 34.4% against 5.6%. And you can see also, very importantly, because that is also something that I would like to highlight, is that not only the mortality, but also the extent, as you can see, of recovery or the possibility to go to a more advanced therapy. And you can see at the end, again, the striking difference between acting beforehand, so very much in, uh, on time, or reacting, so to go on venting when you see stasis and so forth. Look at the differences. This was another paper of Scrader and colleague. They look at the differences between, again, ECMO without venting or ECMO with venting. But here you can see, so the ECMELA or ECPELLA versus ECMO alone. And you can see the, the, uh, the survival at 30 days. And there was a significant improvement if you use a venting with ECMO. But what was really important to me is they look at the difference between if you proactively vent the patient, you can see here, and you can see here with early or de delayed implantation. And you can see here that the, the, uh, the prophylactic venting was really significantly better. Instead, if you delayed the venting implantation, there was no significant difference anymore. So again, confirming that if you do that in advance is much better. So again, this was a, a paper from Alfares and colleagues, again, about timing, so when? And just to give you an idea, again, they showed clearly that the survival of a patient on ECMO is much better if you act prophylactically. And this is very, very important, uh, uh, again, study about unloading with a transeptal cannula, and they showed exactly the same. So it's not only about Impella, which is, for, of course, powerful unloading, but also with the transeptal cannula. And this is, again, from Unoki and colleagues, again, the comparison between a vented ECMO without, or ECMO without venting. And the difference is just in front of your eyes. And this was clearly looking 
at all the type of uh, management and therefore venting also allows you to have a much, much better management of the echo. And okay, Impella looks really, really powerful, really, really effective, really useful. But what about the so-called stupid, as a lot of people now call it, intraortibal on pump? Well, I tell you, that's not so stupid because you can see in this experience, they compare the intraortibal on pump implanted together with the ECMO versus intraortibal on pump implanted after ECMO when they saw a dilatation of the ventricle. And you can see here the survivors, when you have a combination, so an association of ECMO and balloon pump immediately, you can see here the survivors was 81% versus 41%. So again, just with the simple use of intraorti balloon pump. So ECMO and balloon pump immediately, much better than ECMO plus intraorti balloon pump only if needed. And again, optimal strategy, I show you it again, almost 8,000 patients with an overview, and what is really clear, that again, they differentiated about the timing of the intervention, and it is really, again, strikingly clear that there is a much better winning and 30-day survival. What is strange, they didn't see anything, any difference in terms of in-hospital mortality or long-term, but you know, you know that there are so many other factors acting on that. But what is also important, they show that early implant, again, improve short-term survival, but no difference in complication. How? Well, that's another story. We made uh, uh, some studies with my, uh, my PhD fellow, Paolo Meani, and so what we think, we, you have always to, so you, you are used to the goal-directed uh, management of cardiopulmonary bypass, you have to have in mind that you have to have a left ventricular unloading directed ECMO management. So from the very beginning, you have to use at least a non-invasive method, I will describe later. If you see that the, the parameter showing you that the left ventricle is distending, you have a not a pulse, good pulsatility, you have not a good aortic valve opening, well, then I would say you should do something more. But I would put, for instance, intraortic room pump from the very beginning, for instance. And then, you, if you see that this is not plus a non-invasive maneuvers, but if you see that this is not sufficient, well, then you have to strongly consider, I would say mandatory to consider, more aggressive uh, maneuvers. And these are the non-invasive. So what you have to put immediately on action. So you have to have a lower ECLS if possible, so according to lactates, and to have some I would say some inotropic support, not that much, otherwise you are uh, making more damage to them, but also vasodilated uh, uh, therapy if possible, but particularly lower ACS flow, as low as possible, and you can also play with the ventilator strategies and maneuver and management. This is very important for a left ventricular unloading directed ECMO management. And uh, the modalities, well, there are a bunch of uh, things. This was a, a review we made, uh, with, again, with my PhD fellow. And we see that 30% almost is achieved with, uh, with the Impella, 30% with uh, the, uh, the intraortic balloon pump, and a very small amount with the uh, left atrium or also pulmonary artery, as you can see, but with cutaneous or surgical directed. So we have a lot of modalities. But again, remember this kind of concept. You have to have uh, in non-invasive from the very beginning, and if necessary, you go to more aggressive uh, therapy. And these are all the efficacy and, uh, let's say, the extent of left ventricular unloading you can reach with the different maneuvers. You can have a look in this publication of the European Heart Journal. And the balloon pump, I can tell you, because a lot of people think that this is a joke. But look, no balloon pump. The balloon pump is stopped. Look at the aortic valve in this patient. So again, no balloon pump, aortic valve closed. The same patient, we started the balloon pump and look at the aortic valve. So I think that this is clear proof that just with the balloon pump, in a patient with a closed aortic valve, you can make it opening again. So and what we did is we exactly do that. So we put a balloon pump in this 10 patient but look, it was not successful in all patients. And in fact, you see eight patients over, over 10, the aortic valve start opening, 
and we had to, move, to do something more in this patient. And what we do, we do also a pulmonary artery cannulation, and we can use impella, of course, as you know, impella can be done in the periphery or can do from axillary artery. But I think the pulmonary artery cannulation is also very nice. I think uh, this is also for right ventricular directed support. Uh, you can see this uh, percutaneous uh, cannulation of the pulmonary artery. And once you pass the, the apex of the right ventricle, the cannula goes immediately in the pulmonary artery. And, uh, and afterwards, the cannula remains in a very stable position, as you can see. So, and you can use the different devices. So, just to conclude, I think that it's a little bit difficult. It's a little bit, you know, like we need to vent about the need to vent. But I think that my message is that, and I will tell you a little bit more about what we are doing to finish and to conclude. But we have to be immediately active, not wait to do something more. And we are now doing a lot of animal experiments. You can say this is a, a, a comparison between a transaortic, so impella versus pulmonary artery. We did uh, this study. I don't want you to, to, uh, to just uh, uh, annoy you with the data, but just to say that we go with the, also in the pig uh, with, the, with the cannula in the, in the uh, pulmonary artery position. And I don't want to show you that video, you know, but just to say we do that in animals. And, uh, and we show clearly that Impella is the best, uh, uh, of course, more powerful. But also the pulmonary artery catheter has a really very good uh, action, so in case you do not have impel, I think the pulmonary artery drainage is very nice. And also, we use uh, the comparison between the uh, atrial septostomy, another thing that is known, is well known, and we did also this in animal experiment. We created the atrial septostomy, and we look at the effect of left ventricular unloading, and this was certainly working, and so it's a useful tool if, in case you have no pulmonary artery cannula, you have no impella, but you have to remember that this can, can be, you know, can have a price to pay. So remember that you can have bleeding, you can have perforation put in cannula or other tools. You can have thrombosis, you can have hemolysis like impella we know, dislodgement, aortic valve closure. Remember, because if you have a cannula in the left ventricle and you are sucking too much, then there was no forward ejection and the aortic valve will be closed. So in that respect, if you have an aortic mechanical valve, you have to be careful about the amount of, of volume you are, you are retracting from the left ventricle, and all this kind of complication. So the question, so do we really need a program? I would say a sort of, a, you know, well structure, you know, orientation and focus about that? Absolutely, yes. And of course, this is not just one standard or, or just one way, but it's according to the local expertise, the local facilities, what you have. But you have to remember that from day zero, you must do it. So don't do it too late, because otherwise what you have to do is call a priest or even consider something else a little bit too late. So uh, just to show you, uh, this is a paper just published. You can find everything. So again, in conclusion, I think that the venting is a protective, directed echo management. And I think you have to consider that from time zero. Then for, with non-invasive maneuver, whatever you can do, but you have to first think of it, do it, and then monitor. Of course, as I said, non-aggressive maneuver first, and then I think I would use immediate intraortic valve pump if you have only that, and of course, in case you need to do uh, something more aggressive, in case you see you see that this is not successful enough. But we know that this can have a positive influence on the short uh, outcome. There are some new evidence. I think you should do something more uh, to, to you know, also have more knowledge about that. And we have to also to consider that this can be also troublesome. So be careful because complications are around the corner. But I think what we need now really urgently is to have control randomized trial and I think we should do more preclinical studies to increase our knowledge in this respect. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>